Right, so, um, so one note I wanted to make um, before we jump into any questions or um, you know, while, while this is installing is, uh, so we only have 45 minutes during this, this section. Um, so we're a little short on time and we might not be able to help everybody with every technical issue uh, that you run into in this notebook, but regardless, please throw those in the chat. Um, maybe while one of us is talking, the other can help address some of those questions. Okay. Cool. All right. Um, so yeah, if there are no um, immediate questions, then there was a few questions that were outstanding from the feedback form that we sent out yesterday. Um, I'll just go over those briefly and maybe um, we can talk about this a little bit uh, in case anyone, anybody wants to. Um, so there's one question about uh, when you upload an image to FathomNet, can a machine learning model give you an ID back? Um, so currently we don't have any, anything set up to do that, but that may change in the future. We might have, uh, you know, when you upload images, it might actually run those through some model to get some preliminary results. And that's still up in the air and that's definitely something we'd, we'd like to get your feedback on. Uh, what might be useful for you. There's one item, let's see. There's also an item about uncertainty. Um, so quant uh, quantifying uncertainty measurements either in the, the confidence of some annotation or in the ancillary data like uh, lat latitude, longitude, depth information. So just things to keep in mind. Um, we'll, we'll get into a lot more of a discussion period more in the second breakout session when, when we're doing brainstorming. Um, it, and it is that in particular is a very interesting kind of open research question from the perspective of machine learning, certainly. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. And then maybe Eric, you can uh, cover this one probably more in depth. Um, but the uh, another thing that came up is, you know, what sorts of machine learning possibilities are out there, right? Uh, what might you be able to do immediately with Fathom that data? Um, we have a, a list that we've compiled already. I don't know if you want to talk about those, Eric. Um, oh, yeah, sorry, I was just responding to to a chat question there. Um, yeah, we've identified a number of of um, possible use cases is what we're calling them. And I, I'm not entirely sure if the question was about possibilities for um, particular models or workflows, but certainly from the perspective uh -huh. of, oh, I'm sorry? Um, from the perspective of uh, possible applications, we've thought about doing things like running an object detector without uh, the class output. So instead of having it uh, tell you what the annotation is going to be, what is actually in there, just a very binary, is this an object biological that we are interested in to help sort through all of the empty frames that we might not want to spend our time looking at. And that's very much a, you know, optimizing the human in the loop sort of strategy. Um, we've broadly separated out the detectors that we've been working on um, between midwater and uh, benthic imagery. Um, those types of images are just so different that it um, is difficult to imagine training something that would work on absolutely every single version of that. Um, we've wanted to look into designing systems that help us identify vulnerable marine ecosystems. Um, so again, that's more of a broad uh, uh, applicate, or sorry, um, designation that one would give to a region that you're looking at. Um, we've looked into Siamese models. Uh, we've wanted to think about doing things for midwater and benthic transects. So how do you get quantitative uh, species counts that would allow us to say something ecological about a particular region? Um, and then there, there are lots of fun, um, more machine learning specific questions that we could ask using this data that might be difficult to assess with, with existing benchmark data sets. Um, and one in particular that I've been thinking a lot about recently is how to account for uh, and mitigate distribution shifts where there can be a um, statistically measurable difference between uh, what you've trained your detection system on and where you're applying it. Um, and there are lots of subtleties there, um, but if you have a, a large enough discrepancy, then the system could break. 
Um, and again, I'm not in, I'm not 100 sure that that's what the um, the question was originally about. Um, again, there are tons and tons and tons of stuff out there um, regarding specific models and programs that one could use to to start to address some of these questions or any questions that that you all could come up with that you might want to address in the ocean using technology like this. Yeah, awesome. And of course, this breakout session is going to be you know, very machine learning oriented. Um, so as we go along, feel free to throw any ideas in the chat. Uh, we'd love to, to record those as well and talk about them. Let's see. OK, yeah. And the next one I have here, um, my install has finished. By the way, I don't know where everybody else is. But um, once your in install is finished, maybe if we you could, you know, Put a thumbs up in the reactions of Zoom if you can do that, or uh, otherwise indicate that uh, that we're all good to go. Um, that'd be great. Just just so we can know. Um, don't want to don't want to leave anybody behind here. Um, okay. Well. Yeah. Another item I see here on the feedback form is the overall structure of the database, um, if that's available. Um, so besides what Brian talked about yesterday in the, the structure. Um, of the database itself. He showed a little bit of an entity relationship diagram. Um, the database structure itself isn't uh, openly available. Uh, however, the API documentation uh, is well documented, I guess. Um, and it's all available at this link here. I'll, I'll show, show my screen here. I do want to show this in case you're interested. So um, back to the notebook here, right? So if you go to fathomnet.org, um, colon 8080 to get to the API. And then you go to Swagger UI. Um, this will actually give you uh, this, this interface where you can see exactly uh, all of the API endpoints, um, as well as all of the schemas for the, the data. So if you need to drill down into this, it's available here. Um, and in addition, if you want the, the YAML file for that, you can click on this button here at the top and that'll give you um, this YAML file. So uh, a bit more of a technical note, but if you want to see uh, the actual um, API description, that's there. Okay. Okay. Um, let's see. Yeah. So let's let's put the link to this uh, notebook back in uh, the chat in case anybody's joining us late. And also, just as a quick reminder to our latecomers, if you wouldn't mind um, adding the, the programmer or programmers uh, in front of your screen name, uh, that'll help for assigning people to, to breakout rooms in the second session later on today. Absolutely. OK, cool. So we're about 10 minutes in. So we'll, we'll go ahead uh, and pick back up with the notebook here. Um, and I will reshare my screen. OK. Cool. All right, so again, for anybody uh, joining late, this first cell, uh, this takes a few minutes, so uh, please run it now, uh, in, in other words, and uh, we're, we're just gonna keep uh, continuing on here, right? Um, so sometimes uh, we might need to restart the, the runtime because Detectron 2 has some issues, but uh, if this runs okay, then we should be good to go, All right? Okay, great. Okay, so now that everything's downloaded and imported and we're all uh, happy there, um, but in brief, this, this session is gonna be doing three different things. Uh, we're gonna first be creating a data set. So we're gonna specify some images that we want from FathomNet using a generalized image querying uh, constraint where we can specify uh, exactly the, the kinds of images that we want um, you know, using minimum or maximum depth constraints or latitude and longitudes, different concepts. Um, limits on images, things like that. So we're going to specify a data set that we want. And then we're actually going to go through each of those images and download them uh, locally into this notebook instance. So that um, in the next step, right, step two, we'll be able to actually train a uh, deep learning model or fine tune it. Um, and we're going to be using a retina net model in this case. Um, so Eric's going to take over for that, that portion. Uh, and talk about how we can actually go through uh, each of those steps and what all the, the different parameters and hyperparameters that you can tune are. And then in step three, we're actually going to 
say, okay, well, we have, um, you know, we, we've, been, we've been able to train a model, um, but what about these available models in the FedNet model zoo? Um, so step three is gonna be walking through how we can download one of the models from the FedNet model zoo and actually run inference on those images that we downloaded for the original model um, to see what, what the uh, super category detector is gonna find in them. All right, so that's all, all of it in brief. Um, well, let's get into it. Okay, so we'll run this cell here. This will import a lot of uh, the code that we need to run this notebook, all right? And as I said, our first step is gonna be to get the training data for our model, right? Um, so first we need to query for what we want, right? As I said, um, we're gonna need to specify, you know, let's say we wanna train a model on just 100 images of a particular concept. So we're gonna say, after send me a Julie Packard day, right? Um, so we don't want too much training data. So we'll just limit it to hundred images only. If we need to do generalized constraints, what we uh, can do in the API is define a constraint object. Right? And we can get that from the fathomnet.models module. Right? So geo image constraints. So we'll import that there. And then here we can define the constraints. So we'll say our concept that we want is Gersenia, Julie Packerday, and our limit is 100. There's a whole lot more options in this geo image constraints. So I encourage you to, to look at the API reference and see what all of those are. But if we run that, then we'll create this constraints object. Then we can just call this generalized you know, FathomNet API images find function. And this will use our constraints to give us back a list of all of the images uh, that meet those constraints. So if we click that, let's see, great. So this call um, ran back to FathomNet and FathomNet returned 100 images um, of Gersenia Julie Packard. Okay. All right, so at this point, now what we have is a list of 100 um, image data objects, right? We don't actually have the images downloaded. So to get, all of this data uh, ready for training, we still need to do uh, a couple things, right? We need to download the images themselves. So we need to actually go through each of the URLs, download uh, each image onto this notebook instance. Then we need to format the bounding boxes into something that the model can understand. We'll be using uh, Pascal VOC in this case. And then the third thing we need to do is for Detectron, we need to actually structure the directory uh, into the prescribed VOC format. Okay, so first step here is to download the images. What we're gonna do is just create a directory called Gersenia VOC. And by the way, uh, you can see all the files in this file explorer on the left. So if you click that, you can see, okay. So just to start out with, uh, Google gave us this sample data folder. We won't use that, but um, we're gonna create this folder called Gersenia VOC and JPEG images. And that's where we're gonna download the images into. So we're gonna create the directory and then we're gonna loop over our Gersenia images. So for each image, we're going to say that its file name is the image UUID itself, .jpg, right? The reason why we're using the image UUID instead of the file name originally in the image is because the UUID in FathomNet at least is guaranteed to be unique, right? So we won't have um, several images with uh, you know, image zero or something like that uh, overwriting each other, all right? If it already exists, we'll skip it. So you can feel free to re-download this cell if something gets interrupted. I mean, sorry, rerun this cell. Okay, and then for each image, we're going to actually run a request to the image URL. Then we're going to open that as an image in Python, convert it into the red, green, blue color space, just so that it's consistent for uh, training the model on. And we will uh, save it to disk, right? So I'll go ahead and run this and this will take a few seconds. Kevin, while the, this is running, can you talk a little bit about the, the different file formats? So, um, you know, what, what is VOC and what are some of the other options here? Sure, yeah. Um, so v Pascal VOC, um, is an XML file. Um, so it looks a little bit like this. And uh, 
it is one of the, the more popular annotation file formats uh, for object detection. Um, among those are uh, COCO, um, which is a JSON representation. Um, let's see, there's, there's YOLO for training the YOLO model variants, YOLO v4, YOLO v5, uh, et cetera. Um, and let's see, I mean, those are um, some of the, the top ones. I don't know, Eric, if there's any other ones that you want to talk about. No, not not specifically. Just wanted to point out that there are there are other other possibilities in there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, the VOC structure itself, um, how it looks is each image itself will have its own XML file, right? So for for one image you know, .jpg, we're going to create one .xml file, and they will have matching file names. Um, each one has a few descriptors of where the images are. Um, what the file name is, where it came from, the dimensions of the image, how big it is. Um, and then within that, you'll have a list of these objects. And each one of these objects is going to be a bounding box that we get from FathomNet. So we're going to give it a name. And then we're going to uh, you know, add a few tags here and then put in the bounding box information. All right. OK. Great. So, so these images are all downloaded now. Uh, we can check them out in this folder for semi VOC. We have our JPEG images folder. If we double click on one, we can actually see it uh, rendered right there. All right. So the next thing we'll need to do is uh, create a file for Detectron specifically. And this is just a list of all of the images that we want to train on. So we'll, we'll create another directory. We'll create this train.txt file. And then for each of the image paths, we're just going to uh, rate that to a single line. All right, so now we have this file as well in here. And this is just to orient uh, the training procedure to which files we want to train on. OK, and as I said, right, we have all of our bounding boxes in the, the, uh, the native Python objects uh, format, right? We need to convert those into Pascal VOC in this case, All right? So what we'll do is we'll create another directory, again, uh, called annotations. And then we're gonna, we're gonna go through each image and then actually filter out any bounding boxes that have a concept other than Gersenia and Julie Packard. Again, we're only trying to train an object detector for this single class in this case. So we'll go through each bounding box and each image and filter it, it out if it doesn't have that matching concept. Okay, and then you'll see this, um, this nice function here. Um, on the image objects, we can just call this 2Pascal VOC. And what this will do is all the heavy lifting of converting um, the Python object from its um, you know, native representation into the Pascal VOC text format. So then all we have to do is get that text and then write it into the XML file. Right? So if we click that, then we'll see eventually here, we need to refresh, there we go. So there's the annotations. And you'll see there are these uh, .xml files for each of these, right? We can check out, okay, this is the XML file that was just generated. OK, so we've now generated uh, the three things necessary to train on, right? The annotations, the descriptor for um, the training procedure, and the images themselves. And again, this format is uh, specific to VOC and Detectron 2, right? Well, so the next step is going to be to, to train a model. And I'll let uh, Eric take over from here. Well, uh, quickly, before we jump into that, are there any questions about the stuff that we just went over there? I see that there's, there is one here in the, in the chat about whether or not um, there's any particular reason not to use OpenCV versus uh, PIL in order to load and handle the images. No reason. Um, the only reason why we stuck with P, uh, PIL or, or Pillow um, in, in this case was because uh, we didn't need to install it for CoLab. Right? It came preloaded, so it's a little easier. Um, it skips a, a few more minutes of waiting for the initial install. But OpenCV yeah. is absolutely a good solution for 
uh, for reading in images, as well as performing some of those uh, conversions between the different color spaces. Okay. Any other questions here? I see Genevieve noted that Detectron 2 operates in BGR, not RGB. Um, I'm pretty sure that the, the built-in Pascal VOC data loader uh, handles that in the augmentations, but I may have misread that. Yeah, that um, may be bad. And if so, uh, yeah. good catch. <laughs> yes. We'll, we'll fix it. Um, so what, we'll, we'll check the docs, yeah. but that's, that's an easy fix um, uh, if, that, if that is the case. Um, okay, if there are no more questions, um, <laughs> yeah, indeed it is sometimes hard to notice Genevieve these days. <laughs> I don't know. Everything likes a, uh, its own special, special little way of loading things in. Um, but uh, yeah, it would just be a matter of rearranging the color channels. Um, and I believe that that um, Alpentations has a a built-in way of doing that. It'd just be a matter of adding that to to the data loader. Um, okay, but let's let's go ahead and jump in here. So I will go ahead and. Um, share my screen now if you give me just a second okay is everyone looking at the same notebook but this time my instance yeah looking good okay great um so we've loaded in the data um, and now we're going to configure a training cycle so what this means is we're going to tell um, the deep learning framework that we're using, which is Detectron 2, how to load in the data, how to load in a specific model that we want to use, and then how we want it to train. And so it's worth noting that there are tons and tons and tons of possibilities for how you can make this happen. Um, we picked a very, very bare bones way of doing this. Um, in order to, to keep things moving along. So we're not anticipating that this is going to be a, uh, a great model by any stretch of the imagination, but it will train in just about a minute. Um, um, so specifically what we're going to do is we're going to, to fine tune a network on those 100 images that we just downloaded um, from a pre-trained network that the Detectron developers have provided on their model zoo. And this is uh, specifically a, a retina net, um, 50 layers with a fully connected feature pyramid um, and a bunch of other stuff that they note in the, in the YAML file um, that we call in the backbone line here. Um, it's worth noting in this little uh, blurb that we wrote up above it that there are links to all this stuff um, up there. So if you want to go look in their model zoo and see all the other pre-trained networks that they have, uh, you can grab that and check it out. Um, so again, uh, in here, we will instantiate a configuration um, using their get config and tell it to use lots of different um, specific things. So we tell it in the first line here that we want it to uh, use the backbone file that we specified, so that version of RetinaNet. We want it to use as training data the Gersenia uh, images that we downloaded up above. Um, we're not actually going to do any testing with it, so we're leaving this empty for now. Um, we tell it the number of data loaders we want, which is just the number of threads that will open to start moving images to the GPU. Um, and we tell it what checkpoint we want it to use. So this is where it takes the weights from the original network that we're going to fine tune. Um, we tell it the number of images that we want per batch. Uh, we can increase or decrease this depending on the specific hardware that you're using. Um, and then we give it the base learning rate. So this tells it how much to move the weights during back propagation as you are tuning your network. Um, we're only going to run this for 50 iterations, um, so you can run it for more. Um, if you would like, it'll just take longer. Uh, and we're not going to change the learning rate, which is what's defined in the steps here. 
And then finally, we need to tell it how many classes to expect at the output because the network was originally trained on Coco. And instead, we're making it output one class instead of uh, the usual from that data set. Um, and finally, we need to give it a path for an output directory. So if we go ahead and run that, um, it should just take a second to load in the configuration file. Um, how's everyone doing? Is that, is that clicking through? Any questions? This might be pretty familiar to many of you. OK, great. So next, we'll move into running the trainer. Um, so we're just going to use Detectron's default trainer module. Um, it's important to note that that makes a bunch of assumptions about what it is that you are trying to do. Um, and as with a lot of other, um, as with most of their functionality, you can customize it as much as you like. Um, but for the purposes of this demonstration, this will this will work just fine. Um, so what we're going to do is spin up the trainer using the default trainer module. Um, tell it that we're not um, going to resume, and then tell it to train. Um, so this should load all of the information that we have um, made implicit in the directory structure for VOC, um, do the augmentations, and actually send it through uh, the network in training mode. Um, so if we go ahead and click here, we'll get a bunch of information about the actual network architecture, um, as well as um, information about the training cycle once that starts up. Um, so you can actually scroll through in here and see uh, what the network looks like. And we can deal with the error that I have. Boy, oh boy. Um, it looks like I just did not click one of the boxes up here to set up the directory structure. Yep. Let's try that again. No, still doesn't like it. I feel like I'm learning that age old lesson that live demos should rely on videos as opposed to actually doing things in real time. OK, here we go. So while this is uh, cranking through, does anyone have any questions? Yeah, so it looks like Daniel has one in the chat. Um, 100 images is not terrible for few shot learning. Does Velnet provide any mechanism for finding similar unlabeled data sets to the labeled set you're training on? Super useful for things like self-supervised pre-training before fine tuning on your set. Yeah, so um, as far as I'm aware, there is no mechanism to simply find or query for similar data to, to data you already have. Um, but I'd suggest perhaps if you are um, you know, training on a certain geographic distribution, um, so you know, certain marine region or, or something, to uh, you know, download the the information that you get from those the initial query and then just split it, um, you know, eighty twenty or so. Um, yeah, let's see. Uh, Pre-train model is this different from instead of Coco. Uh, um, yeah, I'm sorry. Did, did there. There are some discussions happening internally about ways of querying unlabeled data for, for things that might be similar. But um, in short, we don't, we don't have anything specifically implemented for that. But I think that uh, Kevin's suggestion is spot on that we can filter by geography and other metadata parameters that might help you find something that's similar to the data set that is your, is your target. Okay. Sorry, did, did I interrupt you there, Kevin? Oh, no, no, to... I was just uh, thinking about Genevieve's yeah. question. So, uh, next question here, is there a FathomNet pre-trained model we could start from instead of COCO? Um, yes, so uh, 
The third part of this is actually going to be downloading a model, uh, for example, the, the Benthic super category detector uh, from the FoundNet model zoo and then running inference uh, using Detect Front 2 as well. Um, and there are two other models that we've currently loaded into, into our model zoo. Um, they, I don't know that we would make any particular claims to their optimality, but um, they're, they're our first cuts and they are definitely ocean specific. Um, and there's some evidence that that might, might um, help make a model uh, a little uh, better or more robust or easier to train if you're, if you're also working with image data. Um, Genevieve, have you have you seen those models before, or, or know where to find them? Oh no, no worries. That is why we're we're asking. So while this is running, I'll just go ahead and open a new tab. Um, go to FathomNet. Um, so once again, all this stuff can be found. We talked about it a little bit yesterday. Um, under models in the FathomNet GitHub page, um, where we've listed out um, just the three that we have in there now. Um, so two of them are um, benthic models. One is a YOLO v5, one starts from RetinaNet, um, and one is a midwater detector. Um, and these are three of the use cases that we that we outline in the in the draft of um, our paper that Kakani shared yesterday on on archive. Um, and you can download all of the weights and the uh, information that you need to acquire the training sets and validation sets via those links to the, the Zenodo digital object identifiers. Um, and what we will do um, in the next uh, section here is we're going to download everything um, for this super category detector um, that is in the, uh, the middle here on this table. Yeah, and one thing I want to clarify also, we, so these models are fine-tuned. Um, these are not trained from scratch, I think, to, to answer your original question. OK, great. Um, are there any more questions? It looks like the training, at least on, on my um, instance, has finished. OK, if everyone's good, then we will go on to predicting. Um, so we've trained on uh, the images of that soft coral that we had, um, and the system tells us that it's done. So we can tell it to go into prediction mode. Um, so this uses uh, the output model that we just fine tuned. Um, we tell it uh, what uh, threshold to use for saying whether or not a region is um, correct relative to the human annotation, uh, and then spin up the predictor. Um, so now we can go ahead and run images that we downloaded through the network. Um, so all this loop does is randomly selects three images from the images that we downloaded above, displays them, uh, after running through the model in prediction mode and outputs the, the bounding boxes on there. Um, and again, we would expect this to do very well given that we, we haven't downloaded um, uh, other images. So we're putting in some of the training data through this. Um, and as you can see, it um, finds some of the stuff that we're interested in, but also some stuff that we're not interested in, um, like here. Um, so still some work to be done. Um, and if you would like, you can run it another time to get another three random images. Um, and uh, I, th I think Kevin mentioned this at the beginning, but you can save a copy of this notebook into your into your own Google Drive uh, and come back to it later. And if you would like to, you can manipulate this, uh, train for more or less time, and pump in uh, any images that that you might like through there, not not just the subset of the training data that um, that we're pulling down here. OK, so um, that is um, 
our brief section on training a model. Um, again, it's it's well worth noting that um, there is lots more that you can do here, and that this was purely for demonstration purposes for for how one might implement the workflow, starting from downloading the images and then setting up the training cycle. Um, and I'm I'm sure that many people in here have lots of experience with that and have ideas for how to how to modify and how to start using this for their own work. Um, so before jumping into running inference with um, a pre-trained model, um, are there are there any questions, comments, suggestions? Yeah, so it looks like Daniel has a, a question. Is there a feedback loop between the practitioners and the database where we can add more labels or auto-generated labels or attributes as we work with the data? Um, so I'll say in, in short answer is no, we don't have that feedback loop ironed out yet, but that's something that is a hot topic right now. We're, we're trying to iron that out. So ho hopefully yes, in, in the yes, future. Yeah. Um, but again, uh, that we will be talking about that sort of thing in a more open-ended way in the, in the discussion section in, in about an hour here. Um, so we'd love to, to get that feedback from you. If that's something that you think would be interesting, that, that would be interesting and worthwhile, we will absolutely start putting more effort into, into these things as we go forward. Um, part of what we're hoping, what we're hoping to get out of this is um, your opinions on, on how we should approach these things going forward and, and the broad direction of the project. Um, and then I see a, a question from, from Emma in the chat about, um, whether we've found uh, the IOU threshold of 0 0.5 to be a reasonable uh, threshold for determining a successful detection. Um, we have experimented quite a bit with um, actually layering different confidence thresholds on top of each other. So, so running the same image through a network uh, a number of times with different detection thresholds. Um, and I mean, there are lots of things that go into that, but that's helped us um, do things like find some of the lower confidence detections that uh, might be lower confidence because the uh, the actual object is rather small relative to the bulk of the annotations that were used to train the system in the first place. Um, so it's well worth experimenting with, but that is a, an empirical decision that will need to be made um, in the context of a, of a particular system and a particular um, type of object that you might be interested in detecting. Um, I, I don't know that there's a, a, a you know, magic perfect threshold that will allow you to get everything that you want out of out of the system when you pump an image through. Okay, I think we're pretty short on time, so I might want to skip forward to the uh, model zoo. So, Kevin, I'm I'm pretty sure that we have until nine fifteen. Oh, nine fifteen. Oh, yeah. Never mind. But you might. Well, want that's to what the schedule it. says. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Thank you for the confirmation. I'm <laughs> um, okay, we've got a question in the chat from from Mel's that uh, we did not train with a validation set. Um, so we didn't we figured that we didn't have time to um, uh, run a validation set through in order to uh, get some of the metrics that you might use to judge the quality of your system. Um, the folks at Facebook that put together the Detectron package have a very, very good um, similar you know, workshop uh, notebook setup that goes through that. Um, and we can, we can link to that uh, a little later. Um, and every system that you might use to train uh, has a, a slightly different way of doing that. But uh, being able to compute uh, I mean, average precision and recall and that sort of stuff is built into how many of these systems work. Um, but we, we just didn't include it here um, for the, the sake of time, um, which you know maybe, maybe we, we could have taken an extra five minutes. But um, we can point you to some resources for sure. Yeah, and then uh, let's see, Daniel has a question here too. Um, so roadmap wise, is FathomNet ever going to uh, be trying to take on a more direct role in the solution space for training and inferencing models, maybe implementing workflows directly through the app 
as opposed uh, to taking more of a pure data management slash serving platform. Um, yeah, so I mean, it is certainly within the scope of FathomNet to um, consider taking that on. Um, you know, we're we're still trying to decide that, right? And that's that's exactly what we're trying to get out of uh, these sessions, right? What would be most useful for the community to to take as next steps? So, um, you know, specific items there um, could certainly be things that we work on next. Okay. Um, well, unless there's anything else jumping out, I think we can go ahead and move on to, pardon me, uh, running inference with a, with a pre-trained model. Um, oh, looks like something just popped out. Okay, great. Um, all right. So um, what we did just there was we started training uh, our own network uh, using a small set of images that we downloaded from FathomNet. Um, but sometimes uh, what you might want to do is either experiment with somebody else's workflow or try to implement it for yourself um, in order to either see how it works or possibly just use it out of the box. Um, and so that's part of the value of having something like uh, the model zoo. Um, so what we are hoping, I mean, we've shared some models and we're hoping that as others train their models with Fathom that data, that they will also share it there, um, allowing others to use it. Um, like I talked about, uh, yesterday morning um, that we're advising users to upload their models to something like Zenodo to generate a digital object identifier and then share that via the GitHub page um, that I opened up uh, a couple of minutes ago. Um, so to demonstrate how one might do that uh, programmatically, um, we're going to download that uh, Benthic super category detector from the FathomNet model zoo. So what the super category detector does is instead of considering the, the fine-grained classes um, from all of the annotations that we have from Monterey Bay, we instead collapsed them to 20 uh, semantic categories that will, in principle, encode some more general information about this large group of, of organisms. So these are things like um, you know, fish or soft coral or sea cucumber. Um, we can find all that information in the in the Zenodo repository. So there will be um, a uh, JSON document that shows how those objects were collapsed, um, but we're not going to get into quite that level of detail here. Um, so the first thing that we're going to do is just download the model weights and the configuration file that we used to train that network directly from Zenodo, and we can use we can do that via via wget. Um, so this is just a, uh, a command line interface that allows you to download things from the public internet. Uh, and the exclamation point that we put in front of wget tells Jupyter Notebook to execute the command um, essentially in, in a terminal instead of in the notebook itself. Um, so this will download these model weights from the Zenodo repository into our workspace here. Um, so earlier when Kevin ran through the uh, downloading the data, we got um, our Dersemia VOC. We made the output directory that um, output all of our um, uh, training information from setting up the system. And now we're downloading these model weights into that same folder. It should be done in just a second here. Um, and then we need to do the same thing to get the YAML file that uh, encodes the structure of the data, and that will go a bit more quickly. OK. So now we can actually run inference. Um, so we're going to set up um, the, the same sort of thing that we did above, but um, with a couple of different configuration settings. So instead of using the Cocoa pre-trained weights that we got from Detectron's model zoo, we're instead going to use these Fathom net weights that we got from, from Zenodo. Um, we're gonna set the um, non-maximal suppression and score thresholds here. And then because we're not using uh, the VOC data, we need to tell um, Detectron what metadata it needs. So we're giving it the names of all of the objects that it might detect from anemone to worm. And then once you have all those parameters and file paths set up, you can, you can point um, Detectron to the configurations 
uh, using a, a configuration object. So we reinstantiate the configuration object there, point to the model that it was based on, um, and then give it the specific configuration file weights and score threshold. And then once all that's loaded in, um, you can actually instantiate the model in your workspace. Um, so this is exactly what we did above, where we tell it to build the model from the configuration, um, tell it which checkpoint we want to use, uh, and then load that information in and set it into evaluation mode. So once again, it prints out the actual uh, structure of the network for us. Um, and in this case, um, we're going to tell it how we want it to resize the images. Um, so this is in the, uh, the input uh, min and max size. So that tells the system how we want the image to be resized before pumping it through the network. And finally, we're adding a, an extra NMS layer on top to account for detections of different objects, or rather different classes of objects that might actually be the same object. Um, and lastly, uh, and this doesn't take nearly as much time as training uh, a network because we've already had the network trained. We're just going to grab a random concept and a random image of that concept um, and go ahead and pump it through. So it's worth noting whether or not um, uh, that as we grab these images, it might be drawn from an area that this detector hasn't seen. Um, so if we get something that was drawn from Monterey Bay, we might expect it to work pretty well. If we get something drawn from elsewhere, uh, it might not work quite as well. Um, and likewise, we might end up grabbing a midwater image, in which case the output might be total garbage. So we're not, we're not constraining what it could see um, as, we, as we go through this. Um, so this block of code here just grabs that image um, and pulls it in uh, from FathomNet, uh, much the same way that Kevin did um, above to download the data set for training the Gersemia detector. Um, we get some information about it and then use Detectron's visualization tool to actually look at the image as we crank it through the model, which is what's happening um, in, in this little block here. And then we output uh, one of the images that we get. And in this case, it looks like uh, it, did, it did pretty well. Um, and once again, you can go ahead and uh, rerun this block to grab a different image and run inference on it and see how it works. Um, and you can start uh, even higher up too um, in this block to get a different concept um, if you want something uh, that might be even more different from the image that we just looked at down here. OK, let's see, we've got a, like, what is that, about nine minutes until 9.15. Um, so we've got some time for more questions here. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Um, so it looks like we have a question in the chat from Heidi. Uh, don't things like resizing have to be the same as used during training? Um, not for, for object detection. So we can, we can change the image size as it goes through, um, but it needs to be consistent dimensions. Um, and uh, we, can, we can change that up top and, and see how that works. Genevieve has a question. <laughs> what are some conf confounders you oh. have encountered? <laughs> oh, so many. <laughs> <laughs> Can you be more specific? <laughs> For example, um, water quality conditions. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, we've, um, we have lots of challenges that we've associated with the imagery itself. Um, I mean, certainly if you're operating with a different camera, uh, if you're using um, the, the system, uh, like you suggested, uh, with different water quality, uh, that can be a challenge. Um, the image data that is currently in FathomNet, uh, as Kakani mentioned on day one, has lots of variability in it. So we don't always have these um, very pretty uh, individual objects that we're interested in centered in the frame crisply in focus, um, which can be confounding if you don't have that uh, built into your training data. Um, illumination has been a big one for us. Um, so many of our images come from systems that had very similar uh, sets of lights that we used on it. And when we've tested on other systems, uh, like images that were collected uh, by NOAA's Deep Discover, uh, that, that has been very confounding for uh, uh, networks that we've trained largely on data drawn from Imbari. Okay, great. Um, and then Oriel has a question on uh, how, how do you change the images to, to run through this, this model? Um, so I would, I would recommend changing this last cell here, uh, for example. So you see how we're picking a random image um, in that the first couple lines of code. So if you were to change that, um, then you can feed in some other imagery. So for example, you could load in your own images here, uh, and then instead of using these random images that uh, we selected in the cell above, you could pass in your own images. Okay, looks like another question here. Um, okay, let's see. What are your primary performance objectives? Increasing detection precision, recall, speed, higher performance tracking, all of the above, none of the above? We want it all. <laughs> want it all, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's, it, it's an interesting question. There, there are different targets for um, yeah, exactly. We, we, we do all. Um, but that's the problem. I think that uh, we need to pick and choose a little bit. Um, so a, a system that might have, uh, you know, really high detection precision might not be uh, ideal for certain tasks. Um, so figuring out what it is you want to get out of your network at the beginning before you start training and arguably even before you start annotating is really important. Um, so that's sort of a evaluation first paradigm where you where you pick what it is that you're working towards is really helpful for for setting up how you you develop these systems. Absolutely. Um, and then uh, it looks like Genevieve <laughs> was uh, keen on the the illumination. Um, I I haven't seen any adversarial or generative training approaches. Um, that attempt to account for that, at least in, in the ocean sciences. Um, I've seen some work uh, trying to approach that sort of thing with um, camera traps uh, on, on land. Um, so still sort of open for experimentation um, in ocean sciences. Uh, but again, I, I, um, I need to do a little digging to, to make sure that that's a true statement. Yeah, and then uh, Brian has a question. How broad do you envision the image collections in the future? For example, will FathomNet contain images of caught specimen or will it stay constrained to ROV type images? Uh, and one note I just wanna say there is uh, that we have a specific channel for uh, handling different image types. So we hope that as FathomNet grows, we will be collecting new image types uh, and that when you're actually training a model or, or doing um, other types of analysis here, uh, then you can filter on that type of field to get the, the certain type of, of imagery data. But in, in short, yes, yeah, we, ex we expect to have other imaging types in the future. But that's that's a, another important point. We do wanna hear your feedback on what kinds of imaging types um, would be uh, important for us to delineate there as opposed to um, ROB. Okay, let's see. We have a question from Dan. Uh, I work in the Florida Keys. We're trying to look at coral cover using video transcends. I'm not sure if 
uh, you would use a, just use a localization for each coral and then try to infer percentage coverage from those. I'm new to these methods, so I'm not sure how we would set up and train a model. Maybe Eric, do you want to take that one? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, what you're what you're suggesting um, is one way to infer coverage from from each coral. Um, there's lots of work uh, on uh, point annotations. Uh, in the coral world. Um, so instead of trying to actually localize a full coral, estimating coverage by randomly selecting points on the frame and classifying a, a, a patch of pixels around those. Um, other approaches to doing that are uh, broadly what are called segmentation methods, although those require um, very detailed training data that requires um, lots of very careful uh, human annotation efforts, um, and uh, I can I can point you to a few papers that um, might outline a bit more of that in detail. Uh, it's a very hard problem. Um, oh yeah, and it looks like uh, uh, Emma has been um, working on that same sort of problem, uh, suggesting some stuff there in the in the chat. Yes, and, and CoralNet is a really great resource for that. Yeah, so um, as for inference on video, uh, we don't have a notebook for that currently, uh, but that is something at Ambari in general that, that we're, we're working on now, like trying to perform a detection and tracking using these, these object detectors as well. Um, so converting point annotations to bounding box annotations and using those in training. Um, yeah, so, so that's one thing that we've, um, it's still an open question for us where we've been exploring some ways to, to approach that. Um, but for example, uh, growing out segmentations using uh, edge detection uh, and then you know, fitting a bounding box around that is one approach we've tried. Um, we've even, even tried using uh, gradient class activation maps as a suggestion for bounding box regions. Uh, GradCam++ is one thing that we were using there a while ago. Um, I don't know, Eric, if there's any other approaches that jump to mind there. Um, not that jump to mind immediately. Um, there are, there's lots of work um, that people have been exploring for how to do that kind of thing. Um, particularly in ocean sciences, because a, a Many people had originally done their annotation work using point annotations, um, and there's been progress made towards doing that. But unfortunately, it's not um, it's not a trivial problem. Simply drawing um, a square x number of pixels around an object doesn't doesn't work for everything. Um, there are approaches and more uh, image processing type approaches where you could start from something like that and then do region growing until you you get something. Um, that is reasonable, um, but those are, uh, um, it, it, it's, an, it's another form of either learning or another step in your image processing workflow that needs to be well thought out and well tested before you just trust that whatever's coming out the other end of it is a reasonable annotation to use for further learning experiments. Cool. And it looks like uh, we're, we've hit 16 minutes after the hour. So I think it's time for us to rejoin the main room. Uh, Kakani is going to be talking uh, a little bit about getting FathomNet from beta to 1.0. Yep. Cool. Well, um, thanks for coming and paying attention, everybody. Um, we're looking forward to getting more of your thoughts in our discussions um, at, uh, I think, 9.45 is when we will come back into these breakouts. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks, Eric and Kevin.